Hello and welcome to UNSW Science. I'm Dr. Lisa Harvey-Smith, an astronomer at the CSIRO. And tonight I'm here at the Seymour Center in Sydney and I'm about to talk to a very famous theoretical particle physicist, Professor Lisa Randall from Harvard University. And we're going to talk about the very strange nature of our universe. Lisa, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thanks for hosting me. Now, in your book, Warp Passages, you talked about um, some very strange properties of the universe. The fact that instead of three dimensions that we're sort of familiar with, the universe may in fact have more dimensions. Can you sort of talk us through that? How do you come to that amazing well, conclusion? Kind of, well, I mean, part of the reason I wrote a book was because that's a really tricky place to start. Um, really, you know, you want to talk about where we are in particle physics today and what are the questions we're asking. And um, one of the big questions is, about why the Higgs boson mass, this particle that was discovered associated with particles getting their mass, why its, its mass is what it is, why we found it at the particular energy we looked at, why it's not 16 orders of magnitude bigger, why gravity is so much weaker than the other forces. I mean, gravity doesn't seem weak, but you know, from the point of view of elementary particles, gra the force of gravity is over 40 orders of magnitude weaker than the force of electromagnetism. And that's a real question. It's been plaguing particle physicists for years. And it's in that context that we started exploring this idea of an extra dimension of space, because the question is, how do you address this question? Um, it's just almost seems inconsistent almost in the st standard theory for it to be like that. It's this amazing fudge factor that has to be put in. So what I did in that book actually is build up the whole story, not just about this, because this is one idea that Raman Sundram and I had for addressing it. But the idea is that if there were an extra dimension of space, you can still use Einstein's theory. And then, I mean, by an extra dimension of space, I mean beyond the three we know about, left, right, forward, backward, up, down. There is this extra dimension. You can't see it. But we found by solving Einstein's equations that you could have this amazing property that the strength of gravity in some sense varies exponentially as you go out into an extra dimension. So although gravity might be very strong in one location, we might be, basically if you're any place but that location, you'd find gravity is exponentially weaker. So gravity may have different scales, different um, strengths of different scales. Is that related to string, right. so, string theory as well? So gravity really has one strength from the point of view of our three plus one dimensional universe. So really what happens is the ex masses that you expect vary. As you know, gravity responds to how heavy something is. It's almost like the charge, it's like the mass. So really what you find is that the mass varies in the extra dimension. And the idea of th that sort of underlies this theory has to do with the idea of extra dimensions and something called brains. Um, brains are lower dimensional surfaces in a higher dimensional space. And this is B-R-A-N-E-S. Correct. Not brains right. as That's in the right. thing in it's our like head. It's like membranes yeah. in some sense. The idea is that you have lower dimensional surfaces in a higher dimensional space. So it's not necessarily string theory, but it's sort of motivated by some ideas that arose in string theory. And can we test this theory? Well, yeah. Actually, that's the great thing about it. That's why I like doing particle physics connected to these kind of questions. What you'd look for are particles that have mass because they have momentum in another dimension. And so that's the search. You, and you know what their properties would be. You know how to make them. You know, well, in principle, how they would get made by particle interactions, how they could decay. So you look for particles with those properties. So you do that in particle colliders, like the, the Large Hadron Collider? And when we say you, I mean my experimental colleagues. I don't do any of this. But I tell them that maybe they'll be lucky and find something associated with this extra dimension of space. So you mentioned the, the Higgs boson. Now that's a very famous particle. I think maybe not everyone really understands the, the implications of, of what it means, the discovery in 2012. Firstly, tell us where you were when you heard about the discovery of this amazing uh, particle in 2012. Well, actually, I talk about it. I actually um, was very frustrated because I was actually on vacation because a friend was getting married in Greece. And so when they made the announcement, it was in Greece. So we had all these calls and all these emails for people asking me about this discovery, but I couldn't respond because, that easily because I was there. So I decided to write a short book. I was actually um, away for about a week and a half, and so I wrote a short ebook. You wrote a book on holiday in a week. Yeah. Well, it's an ebook. It was a short thing. Um, but to address, because I, I really wanted to, I was so excited, but I was actually in Greece on a balcony where it was the only place I could get internet on that island. Um, it, and I was very lucky because it opened it just in time to hear this announcement. So that's where I was when, it, when they made the announcement. Wow. 
And so that's the, the book Higgs Discovery. Yes, The Power okay. of Empty Space. Fantastic. So empty space, so explain about the Higgs boson. How, what does it tell us about empty space and how does it change our preconceptions about what empty space is? Well, so there's all these confusions because it's not really the Higgs boson, which is a particle. There's something called the Higgs mechanism, which involves the Higgs field. Mm -hmm. And the Higgs field, it's not actual particles. It's almost like there's charge spread throughout space. It's not actual particles, but particles acquire their masses. Um, elementary particles can acquire their masses by interacting with this field that's spread throughout space. It's a little bit like a magnetic field. You can have a magnetic field without actual matter there. Um, and it's the same way you can have a Higgs field without actual matter. And it's associated with particles acquiring their masses. I don't expect people watching now to understand all this. It's, it's hard enough to explain in detail in a book. But it's, but it's hard to give a one minute explanation. But that's essentially what's happening is they're interacting with charge and that's giving them their masses. It's not quite a charge, but it's the Higgs field. So the way particles interact with the Higgs field, which permeates, does it permeate all of the yes. universe? All yeah. of empty space, so called. Yes. And when particles interact with that, that creates their mass. That's exactly. Essentially the so ones that have more interaction will be heavier. Ones that have less interaction will be lighter. And how do they create a Higgs boson? The simplest way would be just to collide together massive particles and make it. But that, it turns out it's not necessarily the dominant production mechanism. But basically, because the particles of the standard model interact with the Higgs boson, by colliding together particles of the standard model, protons in particular, you can ultimately make Higgs bosons. So what's next for Professor Lisa Randall? What are you excited about in the next five, ten years, your research, the discoveries you think will be made in that time? Well, right now I'm very excited about dark matter. In fact, my recent book, Dark Matter and the Dinosaurs, talks about one aspect of what I'm working on. But I think, um, you know, people... So dark matter is this matter that isn't made up of standard model particles. It's, it doesn't interact with light. It's matter. It clumps, but it doesn't... It's not made up of the standard stuff. It's not made up of charged particles. And... What I'm excited about is trying to find out what it is. What is it? How does it interact? And there's lots of um, observations, experiments out there to try to pin down the nature of dark matter. It doesn't mean we necessarily will. After all, all we know about it is its gravitational interaction. But if we're lucky, we might learn a little bit more. So one of the things, as, as I do as a model builder, is try to anticipate what are the kinds of things you might hope to see. Um, and so that when we do observations, astronomical or particle, we know what to look for. So that's what I'm excited about right now. Now you uh, mentioned in one of your books, Dark Matter and the Dinosaurs, that um, in fact dark matter may have killed the dinosaurs. What do you mean by that? Well, um, you know, it's, it's, an, it's a theory. We don't know if it's true yet. But it has to do with one of our ideas about dark matter. So the science of it is that if there's some small component of dark matter that can radiate the way ordinary matter can radiate, it can potentially form a dark matter disk, the way we have the Milky Way disk. And the idea was that perhaps um, the gravitational potential, the tidal force associated with that disk, could actually trigger meteorite strikes, including the one that killed the dinosaurs and three quarters of the species on the planet wow. 66 million years ago. So this disk would be in our galaxy or in our solar in our system? Milky, right in our Milky Way right plane. In our Milky Way. And the solar system would go through it, which is what could have triggered the extinction. Well, that is fascinating. <laughs> Professor Lisa Randall, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you this evening. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much for having me here.